This is it. This is the final tournament in a tea break, or by now it's actually tournament in a wine glass or beer bottle or something. <laughs> However, you are look joined by Ros Satar from Britwatch Sports. Chris Otto, Tennis Now. And Luca Jacobs, just a tennis fan from Cologne, Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so we so we already for those of you that for those of you that listen regularly, you will have also uh, heard Luca yesterday where we had a real live German talking about a real live German winner, which was rather exciting. It was. But but Definitely. now we are at the end. We are indeed Wimble done. So we had the men's final. And I think it's safe to say that it went pretty much how most of us thought it was going to go. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, we we knew Kevin Anderson was going to struggle after a six-hour, 36-minute semifinal. And he did struggle mightily in the first two sets. And it was nice to see him make a match of it. Actually, I found that to be pretty impressive that he kind of fought off whatever he was dealing with and came came through and had five set points in the third set nearly nearly kind of shook up center court for a while mm -hmm. and then uh, of course Novak with the steely as he was during this tournament was able to navigate his way through and win it in straight sets but yeah pretty much what we expected yeah, yeah. and I, I feel that um I think for a lot of us a lot of us feel that um this is Novak back and I think he did too. He sort of laid down a little bit of a marker for the ATP. He was like, oh, this is going to be the springboard for for better things to come, uh, which I think is roughly translated, okay, older men of the North, i.e. <laughs> I. Federer and Nadal, your time is up and back. Mm. What do you reckon? Well, I think since I see him also like when the hard courts are coming up now, he's like, he's confident now. And I I, I think he might like just getting on a roll now again was uh, especially being always a, well, a hardcore specialist uh, so um with cincinnati and montreal i think or is it toronto uh and then the, in the u.s open coming again i think he's maybe on on top of the favorites well maybe? isn't cincinnati the one masters he's never won yeah, he oh, simply yeah. cannot win but now if he if... wins cincinnati we know we better watch out oh my yeah. god if he wins cincinnati i think i think he just elevates himself to demigod presence hmm. Because, yeah, I think Cincinnati is his kryptonite in the way that Indian Wells is Andy's. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what totally. it is about it. It just hasn't worked out for him there. It hasn't really mattered, though, because he's had a lot of success in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this was an amazing tournament for him. I mean, I, there's no other way to say it. It, it. We knew he was coming in the right direction and making incremental steps to become the player that he used to be or maybe the player now that he can be in the future yeah and boy did he just the win over Nadal was just a springboard to I mean just fourth Wimbledon title 13th major title he's back yeah he's back and the future looks bright I have to say if I was Nadal in particular I would be worrying my little butt picking self because I think he's chasing hard on that 17 um uh, Rafa should be worried but he showed great form here, and he showed that he was neck and neck with Novak. They're going to have to, quote, suffer, end quote, again and when they meet again. And it, I see those two as kind of neck and neck on all surfaces. Rafa, of course, will have edge on clay. He's still, Rafa's had a good season, and he's impressed me a lot. I think he's in contention at Wimbledon is a big deal for him. He hasn't been in a mm. very long time. So this, I think he goes home, and as he said in press, he's proud. He feels good about what he did here, and, and he, he, he took the loss as just a... One of those things, you know, a few points decided it. And what do you think about Federer, though? I mean, for the whole of last year, I think he was in a bit of a daze. I don't think he realised his luck. And at the beginning of this year, in the run-up to Australia, he was trying to downplay his chances a lot. There was a lot of, I'm never going to have a year like that again. And then he went and won Australia. But then didn't didn't go as far as he thought in Wimbledon. So is he the one that's going to worry the most? Because he's sat at 20, which is a respectable number. But is he is he ever going to go and win another major? Now that Djokovic is back? Well, um, I think you never kind of like can underestimate Federer, um, especially on hard courts. But uh, what, what the thing is like, he's getting 36 now. Or well, thirty-six he, now. Be thirty-seven. He's getting like in, yeah, thirty-seven so, in August. 9th. So yeah, so I think well, 
H is always so it's it, well as as much as he is like a really confident and also like physical fine player, but I think H is always a always a pawn. People probably always um yeah try to try to forget at some point. And if he's going to win another major with Djokovic around, tough to say. I don't mm. see it. I don't I, know. Interesting. My take is that. And I, th- I thought this kind of immediately as like things started to progress and we saw what was good, what was going to happen inevitably did happen and Djokovic won this title and he looks like he's ready to win more. I feel like that is going to be the thing that keeps Federer from winning more majors. I, I think I kind of feel like he he's done winning them. No, I wouldn't count him out. Just like yeah. Luka said, yeah. I think there's there are things that can happen. He's that special of a player. He could do it again. I think it's hard. I would, I, if I had to bet, I would say he's not going to win anymore. And twenty is, by the way, more than enough. He's just legendary. So I mean, it it is. But uh, we were saying it earlier um, when we were sort of um, ch- kicking back and having dinner. For the first time in a long while, I've heard Roger start to align himself with some of the records that the women hold. So it would have been a ninth. Oh, he was chasing not Martin Nav- Navratilova's nine titles oh, yeah. it's the first time i've ever heard him do that i don't know whether that's the andy murray effect where he's so outspoken um on sort of women's rights and and, and the way the women's sport is being held that federer thinks he wants to get in on some of that action i don't know <laughs> but i mean it's interesting because for the first time i've ever heard him say it and i thought it was refreshing was that he weighed in on you know serena's comeback and if she had managed to equal Margaret Court's record, how amazing that that would be. Normally he's quite reticent to sort of get involved in any of that kind of thing. And I don't know whether it's because of the political or like the emotional connotations that so very many people want Margaret Court's records to be expunged completely, Um, (laughs) you know. And I mean, I've said it before, I want Serena to, to to get past it, get to 25 and then that's it, you can call it a day. Because nobody's ever gonna, you know, nobody's ever going to beat that. Well, I do too, and I'm nervous now after what I saw in Saturday's final Whoa. that she may not, because it was a great moment for Angie Kerber. It was a not so great moment for Serena Williams. She she was outplayed, you know, on center court, a place where she's won seven titles. So she's got a lot of work to do. And I think the truth of them. I mean, we said it in our podcast and our wrap of the ladies final. The truth of the matter is, Kerber was the toughest opponent that she'd ever faced in that whole in that whole run up which is as it should be it is a Wimbledon final yeah. um so she should be facing the very best but sh- but Kerber man you know let's uh I mean what what were some of your favorite sort of parts of the uh of the, of the tournament because for me seeing Kerber come back to how we know she can play was made the tournament for me well for me it was basically like when, when we started especially the the women's side well the draw f- fall apart just really <laughs> quickly like we lost all the seeds <laughs> and then in the end we end up with Kerber, who was actually the the highest seed <laughs> which is like it isn't insane like that she finally and then in the end managed to like get it done and just like say to the all the others like Okay, here I am, and I'm 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 earning my place, and I'm earning my my win here. It's it, just I, I probably feel like this is my favorite moment because I never thought Angie Kerber would be. Well, she's a two-time. Well, she was a two-time Grand Slam yeah. champion. She's now a three-time Grand Slam champion, but that she actually is possible to do that another time in Wimbledon against Serena Williams. I'm over this, and I'm well. I'm over this, overwhelmed in a positive. Yeah, I was going to say you're overwhelmed. Yeah, no, I'm overwhelmed. Over, 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 overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Oh gosh, that the, the, where do you start with with that performance? Um, it was flawless, yeah. absolutely flawless yeah. from start to finish. She was so on it. It was, it was, yeah. It was, I didn't think about Angie Kerber too much. I knew she was a potential contender before mm-hmm. Wimbledon started, yeah. but I had never could have imagined she would play this well and be so fierce. And it's great because 2016 was a magnificent year. We fell in love with Angie Kerber that mm-hmm. year, and, it, and her story was just one that we all could. Could just become. We were just amazed by how how far she'd come, and she had a lot of failures in finals before, mm-hmm. and then she became a success. And then 
last year she was back to where she was before. She kind of just yeah, lost it. Almost yeah. like 2011 where she lost like oh, yeah. a ridiculous amount of matches in a row and was thinking of quitting. And yeah. then suddenly in the US Open, it all came good. And yeah. then from that point on, she launched. Yeah, and I think, I think if, if she continued in the way she had in 2017, it might have tarnished her legacy. But now she has polished it up. She's a certain Hall of Famer. Yeah. I mean, and we think she can win more, maybe four, maybe five majors. Yeah. Oh, and it's also really, like, really cool at the moment since, well, Germany just realized that she now won Wimbledon, and Wimbledon has a big effect in Germany, oh, yeah. actually, since it might be the Becker and Graf effect, but um, she, there was a lot of media uh, today. Um, I got a picture from my parents uh, sending me um, uh, the papers in the morning where she was in the front papers and everything. So people realized, and she was actually on the second um, German channel, and the quotes were even quite good. So mm. she got everything she, um, well, the whole the whole Wimbledon final got everything it deserved at the end. Yeah. And she deserved it in the end. Yeah. I mean, we were joking, you know, and you jokes. Because she walked in, they'd obviously given her, uh, her, 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 her um, Wimbledon members club thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Carol Bouchard and I started giggling. And she goes, yeah, look, I have my members thing. Look. That's a great so, moment. So proud of it such a great moment um you know it's it, it's remarkable um and even when somebody you know i remember uh when she got the australia and ubi um scanabata was like kind of i have to ask you about flavia um and <laughs> and on, when she'd won he was like kind of i just have one question she goes about flavia right you know oh. i mean when she wins everything is lifted off her shoulders and she's like oh, oh, quite obviously and everything you know she's she's hilarious to, to listen to um and she was the same here it was just it was just like kind of a, a, a whole brand new angie it was nice to see yeah because she's she's pretty serious in most of her pressure uh pressers and is kind of canned and is careful mm. and not as bubbly as she was after that fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was really cool to see, and she deserved it. She yeah. deserved to have fun with that. I mean, yeah, it was a rum old, uh, it was a rum old Wimbledon, like with all the seeds scattering in the women's side, and yeah. then we t and and the irony of it, of it was that Carolina Pliskova was the the slamless number one, the, the active slamless number one, um, who was then the higher seed, who then crashed the out in quite spectacular fashion. On Manic Monday, and it was like, yep, okay, we've got Angie then. Mm, <laughs> it was... She got past the second round, big success for her. Yeah. Well, for Karina, right? Yeah. 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 Hey, Even though... hey, it's a step. Yeah. But um, so what we what are your overriding memory? Like Angie aside, what's your overriding memory, uh, either as a journo or just a general person of Wimbledon this year? Um, that's tough, actually. Um, I would say. It was a uh, um, the first week was chaos, and then we got <laughs> settled in a little, and ended up with these deserving winners. I okay. think that's that's how I feel well, about it. I have I have a lot of different avenues to travel down. Things that that moved me in the first week. I love the young pl players. I love to see watch Stefano Tsitsipas break oh, yeah. through and become the first Greek to reach the second week Greek male in the Open era. And I also enjoyed watching Denis Shapovalov play. He lost in the second round, but he did beat Jeremy Chardy in the first round. And I think he has a bright future at Wimbledon. Just kind of watching those players kind of make their steps and deal with all the difficult situations that they run into, that was cool. And then, of course, the second week for me was about oh, chaos and Anderson <laughs> beating Federer 13-11 and then the Anderson-Isner crazy oh, match. But, but I think what sticks with me more than anything was the Novak Djokovic and Rafa Nadal match in the semifinals over two days, the quality of the tennis, the, the importance of it for Djokovic and how he was able to then turn around and win the title. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Wow. I think for me, being a Brit, it's just been bizarre <laughs> to have four weeks of being at home with good weather. Five oh. weeks even. Because I came back from Paris where it was humid as hell and raining quite a lot of the time to a week here with the guy from Nottingham saying, do you want to come up to Nottingham? And I'm like, no, I have no clothes. <laughs> I've been away for like two and a half weeks. I need to do laundry because I'm going to be away for four weeks on the trot. I've never known weather like it. Um, oh. and, and what was interesting was, you know, if you went down to Orangi Park on that first day, 
and listened to the sound of the ball on the strings, you would have thought you were in a hardcore because everything was just that that really sort of tight thwack mm-hmm. that you hear. Mm. There was none of that kind of almost cricket like you know ball upon willow bats and you know people sort of politely clapping. It was just like it was something in a hardcore in in the middle of in the middle of grassy Wimbledon. I mean the weather was amazing. We had one little day of rain, didn't we? One spot of rain. One spot of rain. Okay. Um, my other overriding feeling was um, if you have a bunch of tennis writers come to your house on Middle Sunday to kick back <laughs> and relax, mm-hmm. what's the first thing they're going to do? Go grab your bats and play tennis in the back garden. Of course. <laughs> That's my overriding thing of Wimbledon. Okay. Uh, but all in all, I think... We've got Wimbledon 2018 in the books. We've now got three of the four slams out of the way. So out of all of the winners that we've had thus far, do we feel that there have been any big shocks? So let's start with Australia. What's Australia? In terms of the winners. Oh, that's a tennis tournament. Yeah. That was so long ago. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, what? What's Australia? It's where we send all our criminals. Yeah, right. (laughs) I mean, I think Wozniacki was a big surprise. I thought everybody thought that Halep was going to win that one. That's the biggest surprise, I think. That Wozniacki... That she finally made it. And then, I suppose, the biggest surprise at Roland Garros was that Halep did finally yeah. make it from a set mm. from a set and a breakdown. I think we knew it was coming, didn't we? I think it was always coming. For me, she, she was beginning to become like the female Andy. Yeah. Where, you know, when she got to her fifth one, she was going to have to take herself off to the toilet, and have a good talking to herself in the mirror, and then and come yeah. back out and not be that person. But she did it a slam earlier. But, you know, we couldn't help but be surprised by what we had here, because everybody thought that Federer skipping the clay court season um, and coming in would be would be, would be be a done deal. Except one of my colleagues, Marianne Bovis, had said to me that she thought he was tired in Haller. And when he was taken oh, yeah. to three sets by mm-hmm. Chorich, she was like, he looked tired. And he hadn't been taken, if I'm right, he hadn't been taken to past three sets until he got Sir Kevin. Right? Yeah. yeah. He won all straight sets. And yeah. he, he yeah. had, you know, he stretched his streak to 34 consecutive That's sets. That's it, he matched his own record. And then it just fell apart from there. All well, credit to Anderson, but. He did look tired in Halle. Oh, well, I agree on that. Oh, really? uh, also, and uh, well, when he won, at, like Stuttgart, he felt like well, pretty confident. But in Halle, he like I think from semis or from the quarters, he looked like always a little step light and always uh, well tired in in general. And then playing against Chorich, who was actually like, a really physical player, mm. and then uh, even it's if it's on grass, which is Federer's probably most famous um, surface. Yeah. But um, in the end, well, Chorich well, paid well. Won it and uh, Federer yeah. looked, looked tired. Oh, he didn't pay it, off a Chorich who went no. out the first round. <laughs> yeah. no, no, not at all. <laughs> no, yeah, that Federer match with Chorich really opened my eyes because he got broken in the third and then he got broken again. He lost 6-2 in the, in the third. Mm-hmm. And, you know, typically you see Federer losing a third set breaker to someone like that. You know, not just get kind of run off the court. Yeah. That was strange, you know. And, and Chorich is not like a grass court uh, it, it player. No, it made no sense. It has been. Uh, no, no, his yeah. results have been really yeah. terrible. I mean, so, I mean, and, and that's the thing. The gamble did not pay off for Federer in mm-hmm. this particular regard. Um, you know, I mean, I always like winding up Federer fans by saying, yeah, can you really call somebody the goat if they actually skip <laughs> huge parts of the season? I, um, yeah. I mean, I don't think you can, and I and, and I think the same is true for Rafa as well. I don't think you can refer, you know, if they consistently miss out huge chunks of the season for longevity. I grant you, right? You can't necessarily call them the goat. Rod Labor just played everything and anything. Mm. I don't see, I didn't see Rod Labor ever saying, "Oh well, you know, I, I don't like clay. I'm never going to win on clay, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to play the clay court mm. season." Different sensibilities back yeah. then. Yeah, I don't know if you can compare it. I, I don't think you can, but somebody my, has to be the, the goat when it's yeah. all said and done. And, well, <laughs> and right now, for, for my money, the goat is Serena. Until somebody beats her, twenty three slams. Uh, don't come at me. Don't come at me, bro, with this five set malarkey, mm. because. To win a slam, harder best of three, I would think. Yeah, you don't have a chance to play yourself in. If if we've been playing best of three, are oh, you listening, Ben? If we'd have been playing <laughs> best of three, um, there's no way we would have had Anderson in in the in you know taking out Federer because he'd run out of chances. Yeah, I suppose. So that's a good point. 
I'd say Serena's in the lead, and Serena has the potential to get more. And as we talked about, Roger has the potential, but I don't know what we can expect from either of these players in the next year. And, mm-hmm. and how much more can, do they have to give? And, and let me just throw this in here. So all of them have... have Oh, let me just let me just think this through. So both both Nadal and Federer have taken huge chunks off and come back, and I don't think they've ever really rushed it. You could argue that Rafa's had a really bad string of luck with taking time off for his knee and then having his wrist play up as well, and having a run of injuries one after the other. But it wasn't like he come back too quickly, like Djokovic did in Australia, mm. that really set him back a lot. And we saw the same with Vavrinka. We almost saw the same with Murray. Mm -hmm. I think if Murray had played, he probably would... uh, He he said that he wasn't going to be at risk if he did play, but he wanted to be able to do himself justice. But I think deep down, there's also an element of, you know, what if I slip? Because grass is notoriously fickle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or or what if you play back-to-back five-setters and reach a level of fatigue that you hadn't seen before and that your hip gets... The surgically repaired hip comes under a new type yeah. of stress. You know, he made the right move. Oh, he definitely I agree did. On that too, yeah. I, I definitely. And I, I saw a report that um, as soon as he stepped foot on a hard court, he felt instantly better. Oh, okay. Um, these two natural surfaces, you know, the tear battue, which will really, really screw you up. Um, and has done for Murray before, you know, causing him to go uh, back injuries, causing him to miss the entire, that, that entire swing. What, 2014 was it? 2013? 2013 he skipped Roland Garros mm. and the clay. Um, and and grass. They're both very, very tactile surfaces that come out and get you. Yeah. The, mm. the hard courts are going to be a very nice, even playing field, I think. I think it's very exciting. I think the next six months... Yes, six months left of the year, guys. Okay. I think the next six months... <laughs> Uh, are going to be very exciting. They should be. They Andy, should be. Andy can start to build something on hard, and maybe by U.S. Open he's a factor. Right now it's kind of wait and see. Let's, but yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. And, but, yeah, and he's about to start in Washington, right? Which yeah. is about two weeks to go now. No, it's a two fifty. Mm-hmm. Oh, so there's yeah. no there's no pressure. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Well, it's been a great Wimbledon. It's been a blast, of course, having Chris Otto staying here. Um, and... Lord, I prefer Lord Otto. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Lord Otto has been um, the resident chieftain of now apparently Ham, Kingston, and Richmond. So I'm quite kind of worried what he's going to lay claim to next year. Mm. Surrey, maybe the entire county of Surrey. I haven't been. It's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what? What are you then? So if he's well, the I'm Lord, a guest then. <laughs> are you just like the help? Well, the help, yeah. That's, okay, that sounds good. Okay. okay, maybe next year. Maybe well, maybe next year, year we'll grab well, I, can, I can rise in my position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, gentlemen, very much for your time. Thank you, people, for listening and indulging us in our nightly rambles. You've been listening, of course, to Ross Sato and Chris Otto and Luca Jacobs. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.